Okay, is it working? Um, it was. Back and forth, manually again, that it works. Yeah. Try it now. Great. <laughs> presentations about everything else but culture and now I've got some time to talk about just culture so the uh, the culture of diadema from larvae to juveniles uh, I'm also working for uh, the University of Applied Sciences from Halladestein and the last three years my focus was on the culture of diadema uh, the first two years were in the Netherlands and now since the year I've been here on SEBA 
uh, trying to repeat the process and get more data on settlement and other interesting things. So here on the left, we see a very nice zoom picture of a very uh, well-developed larvae. It's about half, half a millimeter big. The arms can be quite long, a couple of millimeters. And in the middle, we see some grazing juveniles in the lab in Leeuwarden. And on the right, we see what we would like to see, which is a lot of diadema on natural reefs in the end. So to come back to what Elwin uh, already talked about is that there are several restoration methods for diadema. Uh, most of those methods are dependent on natural larvae, natural larvae supply in the water. So that's your translocation, your sediment collections, uh, and your assisted natural recovery. If you don't have a natural uh, larval supply or a natural uh, population, source population of which you can take diadema from, uh, the option you're left with is the culture of diadema. So actually culturing them from gametes to juveniles. So that culture is what I will talk about today. And here on the right, we see, I, I've got this presentation filled with baby diadema pictures. So here we've got a small larvae of about uh, a millimeter big. We can just see that the spine start developing, you see the tissue around it. And you still even see the arm of the larvae on the, on the picture. So the, so like the funny looking spine is not the spine, but it's actually still the larval arm, which the tissue is being reabsorbed into the urchin body. And then it will grow out into a nice big black urchin yet, hopefully. So, already touched it a bit, but why would you want to culture diadema? Uh, and it's, it's one is for restocking. So uh, if you get a setup where you can culture them on a large scale with a high outputs, you could eventually uh, restock the reefs with cultured urchins. One of the main benefits is you're not uh, dependent on the natural reproductive cycle of diadema. So you don't, uh, you're not, uh, you don't have the seasonality, which you have with natural uh, supply. Uh, you can culture on places where there's not even diadema. We've cultured them in Leeward in the Netherlands. It's kind of cold there, it's not in the Caribbean, so they don't naturally occur there. But if you have a source population, we just bought them from an, uh, from an importer, they came from Cuba, but you're able to culture them. One of the reasons why the recovery is lacking is that larval phase. And we know very little about that larval phase. Uh, we know that they're out there in the ocean floating around for weeks, uh, but how they develop, how quickly they develop, we only know that from that rearing. It's also the next step where you can see what influences the sediment and maybe even the post sediment survival of this uh, diadema can be studied much better if you have control over their life cycle and can actually culture them in the laboratory. And the last point is something I just added these last couple of weeks, but it's already been mentioned, or it was a question by Marijn in the last presentation. Um, if you still have a couple of survivors after the die off we are witnessing now, maybe they are more resistant. So, what if you take them as a source population and culture them? That might even, uh, yeah, you may be able to create a more resistant population to hopefully uh, have no die offs in the, in the foreseeable future. So I use the same picture here as Elwin used and made, which I really like. Uh, so here we see life cycle of diadema, where you have the adults that spawn. Fertilization takes place in the water column. Yeah, that's if the eggs hatch, which, which can be up to million, like a female can release up to 20 million eggs, which is a lot. Um, so you only need a few of them to survive. And also for our culture, this is never the bubble neck. Um, you get your gametes, the larvae hatch within one or two days. Um, the larval phase is quite long, especially if you compare them to other sea urchin species in which it's on average about two weeks, 20 days, where you need to keep them in culture for diadema, it's uh, at least 35 days, but even as long as 90 days where you have to keep them uh, before they are able to settle. Uh, so the larvae go through quite, uh, quite a big change where for those 35 to 90 days they're in the water column floating around and at a certain point they need to settle so they need to find a substrate to attach themselves on and then go through a uh, through a metamorphosis where uh, the urchin itself doesn't look anything like the larvae. 
And after that, hopefully, you have a lot of survival uh, where the juveniles can reproduce within one year. So they, they grow to three to four centimeters test size within one year, and then they're old enough to reproduce themselves again, and the loop continues. I put down the estimated maximum age, but that's just a really bad, uh, good guess because I'm not sure if anybody knows how old they, they get uh, in total. There's cold water urchin species that can live up to 100 to 200 years, but I don't think that the diadema uh, antelan will be that old. Uh, in our laboratory, we had them for a couple of years and they were probably already a couple of years when we got them. Um, and the first groups of that we used, most of them already died again. But if it's Let's say it's old age of which they died. So in that case, it's about uh, six to eight years. So to start, um, I will first go through this life cycle of the diadema and the part of the culture that we know. I will touch upon some of the culture methods which have been uh, tried before after that, and then I will go into more detail about the culture method that I developed. But before I wanted to talk about the culture method itself, I thought it was important to start talking about uh, other important factors considering when you're considering the culture diadema. So to start, we have to start with the broodstock because you need adult animals to get the gametes. Um, in the case of Leeuwarden, we bought animals which were meant for the uh, aquarium industry. So you can just buy them. Uh, they would be uh, requested big urgents. Uh, it took a couple of shipments before they actually survived because they sometimes cut their spines to save on shipping. And after we treated them with antibiotics, they survived. They did very well, and we had many successful culture runs with them. Uh, but of course, here on Seba and in other places, if you want to culture them in the Caribbean or near a location where you still have adults, you can take a couple of adults out of the uh, out of their habitats to either keep them as your broodstock in a separate tank. Or if your population is close by and you have enough, you can just get urchins, uh, get them to spawn and uh, collect their gametes. The you, from the other side, it's very hard to see if you have a male or a female. So we only find out after they spawn, so after they release either their, their egg or sperm, then we know if it's a male or a female. But from the outside, it's almost impossible, or if somebody knows how, please tell me, but it's impossible to see what we have. In general, you have a 50 50 percent male female. Uh, if you want to start up a, a boots of tank, a tank of 500 liters will hold up, uh, hold a population of about 10 animals, which should be enough to continuously provide you with uh, gametes throughout the year. If you want to spawn and culture them throughout the year, it's best to keep them at a constant temperature because it seems that the seasonality and also the temperature of the ocean also affects their uh, reproductive season. So if you can keep them at a constant temperature in Leeuwarden, you would have them at 25 degrees in a constant life regime. You kind of fool them in the fact that there's no season and they just eat, they, they uh, make their gametes and you can uh, get them to spawn. Um, a last one I do want to mention is if at a certain point, uh, large scale culture would be possible. You, of course, have to think about genetic diversity as well. So, here on say that we culture the diadema, we want to use urchins from a local population and not from somewhere else. And you want to use as many animals as possible to keep the, uh, the animals that you're using as diverse as well. Although, a note on that is that we don't even know what the source population of say is. It could be that our source. Larvae come from another island and Chris along with the trees. So those are still many factors which, which are quite unknown. Uh, so spawning can be done and on different uh, in different ways with the urchins. Uh, you can break open the urchins, remove the gametes, add the sperm to the eggs, and you can have your fertilized eggs. Um, another use method with uh, other urchins as well, if, if you inject them with potassium chlorides, uh, just inject it inside of the, of the body, put them, you can take them out of the water, put them upside down, and they will start spawning. The most friendly way and the method that we also use is uh, through heat shock. So we prepare a tank 
with uh, water that's about 30 degrees Celsius. So if they are in the water and it's 25 degrees, you tend to use twice the degree difference. You put them in a tank with uh, warm water and within about half an hour, they tend to release their gains. Um, and here you see a picture where you see one of the urchins that just spawned. So on top, that's where the anus is. And there's four or five pores where they can release their gametes from. It can be quite, sometimes they almost like explode, but it's just, like I said, 20 million eggs we found once that was, was quite amazing. And in the right picture in the bottom, you see us. Um, so that's John, one of the students that was here in Luca, where we put them, uh, we collect them from the harbor, put them in warm water, collect the gametes, and use that as the start of the culture. And one fun fact before the die off, um, you had quite brutal research where they would just take a crowbar and hit an urchin to see if they, if the other urchins would run away or not, if they could perceive other urchins. So breaking open the urchin and removing gametes was not strange before, well, well, when there was still enough. Uh, of course, you can never do this again, but I always kind of laugh when I, <laughs> when I come across this kind of research in especially older papers. Uh, so yeah, you're just running away. Oh, fish are eating the dead debris of the urchins. Um, with the sea shock method, um, we have never observed any stress or mortality afterwards. So you can reuse them uh, without any harm, which of course is very, very good. The next phase is the larval phase. Um, here on the bottom, you see a nice depiction of the larvae where uh, the size of the pictures is, is quite similar. So it's about one millimeter in size, these quadrants that you see. So they develop from uh, egg, the egg hatches after one day. They start forming their, uh, their intestines within two to three days. So that's also when we culture them, when we start feeding them. Um, and then they just start growing. They start elongating their arms. And at a certain point, you find this rudiment inside them, which is the first growth of the uh, actual uh, urchin body. So uh, on day 22, you can see that they have a bit of external rudiment on the left. That's actually some sort of tube feet, which are already developing and coming out of the body. The rudiment can be inside of the body or outside of the body. Um, at first, it's not really a tube feed, but after a couple of days, and it starts around day 35, where in this case, these were really early, but these were day 22. Um, they have these tube feeds, which are already tube feed of the juvenile urchin. And that's also what they use to attach themselves with. Uh, so after the rudiment is completely formed, they, I will call them competent. In the next slide, I'll go into a bit more detail because all this terminology about rudiment competency, it's a lot, but it's also very important. So if their tube feet are strong enough, they can attach themselves to a substrate if they got the right cues for sediments. Uh, and then they will go through metamorphosis. And metamorphosis is the uh, process of transforming from a larvae to a juvenile urchin. And the picture here on the top right uh, shows an urchin that's actually just going through the process. So you see that it's already attached to the surface. It's walking on one of those tube feet. It's like these silly walks, what they do. It's really fun to look at them on the microscope. They're like running away from the light. But you can also still, still see the larval arm. So sometimes people say, is the larval arms, are those like the first spines? But that has nothing to do with the spines of the baby urchins. So here it's reabsorbing the tissue from the arm because there's quite a lot of energy in the flesh that they still have on their arms. They reabsorb it to their body and then they start getting their spines, which takes about the entire process takes about 24 hours. And think if you're an urchin, the, the larvae, they just have a mouth on which they put in microalgae. But these sea urchins, they have these really complex feeding apparatus uh, which is which are five teeth of which they use to scrape off all kinds of stuff from the rocks. Uh, and they still have to develop it when they just settled. So the first week, uh, they, they can't eat anything. So they really need to get all that energy to survive that first week in their larval phase. Um, so some more pictures here about competency. competency. So at the end of the culture, 
let's say between 35 days and up to 90 days, um, we want to see if the larvae are ready to settle and go to metamorphosis. On the picture with an A, you see a nice larvae. Uh, it has quite long arms and it's, it has a very thick body. Um, and at a certain point, you, you can see the rudiments, which you can here see as a kind of white tissue within the body of the larvae. Um, and picture C, you can also very clearly see the Hespedis laria, which are kind of these uh, rib arms. Not all the larvae have them, but if the larvae do have them, it's a very good sign that they are ready to settle and that you have a high quality larval culture. Rudin can be inside the body, so here you can just see it by the white tissue. This is the gut, by the way, the dark spot in the middle, which you can see in all the other pictures. But in picture D, you can also see that sometimes rudiments externally. So you can really clearly see the tube feet sticking out, almost flying around like, where can I, where can I settle? Where can I land? Where can I? Go through metamorphosis, and then finally in the picture, as you see the small, uh, the small settled urchin which went through metamorphosis and has some very small spines already. Um, yeah, so what we do, we um, look throughout the culture. We take a very good look at the larvae. How do they develop? How do they look? How big is their rudiments, and are they ready to settle or not? And then we select the competent larvae and use them for settlement experiments uh, or just for uh, yeah, generally culturing as much as many settlers and juveniles as possible. It would be nice if they're all competent at the same time, but that's of course not the case. So on the left, um, there's the uh, competency percentage and also the settlement percentages uh, of uh, larval culture that we had. So we started these experiments at uh, 35 days post fertilization, so after they uh, after we spawned, and at day 35 we saw the first uh, larvae that settled within the culture bowl that we used. And in the top we see the percentage of competency. So we score competency if we see if we say that the rudiment is fully grown either ex externally or internally. We did it at two types. At two temperatures, which is not really relevant for this graph, but you can see over time the percentage of competency increases. With those uh, exact same larvae, we also tried to settle them, so we put them in a petri dish, gave them nice settlement cues to settle on, um, and we did not see that all of, this, all of the larvae that were competent also settled. So it's still uh, it, it's, it's still kind of a gray area. You know that they're ready to settle, but not all of them settle which could be that we don't know exactly yet when a larvae is ready to settle, or that the cues that we used to get them to settle here were not strong enough. And settlement cues I will talk about a little bit more later. Here on the bottom right, by the way, you see a nice dish with about 100 settlers, so that's what you like to see. Get a lot of those uh, really small red seed urchins uh, from your uh, settlement tests. So that's a bit the process that we're going through. So you have your larvae, you have your different, different phases, you have to watch out for competency, you want to get them to settle as much as possible. Uh, but how do we actually culture them? Well, we weren't the first to culture them. It has been tried uh, before with success as well. Uh, one of the first publication was by uh, Jimmy Eckert. That's in, uh, in, in the 90s. Um, she had, I think, a couple of settlers. Her main goal was to show the process and the development and the developmental time of uh, diadema larvae. Um, but there have been more uh, papers. This is a paper by Lisi where they culture diadema in conical tanks, in larger tanks. They don't really describe that well how they were cultured, but they used the uh, larvae to see how fast diadema grow. Another larvae, but the idea by themselves. There's a nice report uh, from 2009 where they also done quite a lot of experiments on larval culture with diadema, as we have been doing in Leeuwarden and here on Seba, where they also cultured, I think it's about 1500 competent larvae, uh, but they and they will probably had a couple of hundred settlers as well, but it's not really clear from their reports. And uh, very recently, 
A nice report by uh, Bill Nicodol on a larger scale system, a system with half chrysals where they um, want to develop a system where you can culture the diadema larvae on a really large scale, like produce thousands, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of juveniles. Um, yeah, so these are the papers. And what I want to start with is, is why is it so hard and what do you need to culture diadema? And one of the most crucial parts is water movements. The larvae themselves uh, are negatively buoyant, which means they sink to the bottom. And of other species, larvae can sometimes swim or they can determine on what uh, part of the water column they want to be. And larvae of diadema, they cannot. So they'll just sink to the bottom. They can move around a little bit. They can, uh, they have some, Flagella on their arms, which they mainly use to get water current towards their uh, towards their gut, so they can keep the microbes from the waters. Um, so one of the tasks that you need to do if you want to culture diadema is um, keep the water in movements, make sure that there's some type of current which so that the larvae don't sink. But you also don't want to inflict mechanical damage to the larvae if they hit anything or if they um, or if they're touched by water bubbles, they get damaged pretty quickly. So the options that you have are pumps for water movements. You can use a pump, but you don't want the larvae to be sucked up in the pump. So you need a division between your culture vessel and the pump. So you need filtration systems with that. Uh, it could work, uh, but it's, it's kind of high tech and difficult. Another uh, often used method is an airlift, where you use water bubbles to go up, which lifts water and creates a natural current in that way. Uh, but like I said, it seems that uh, water or the um, air bubbles tend to damage the larvae, especially the, lar the larger uh, larvae of about 20 days and older, when they really get their long arms and they go to the face of their trumpets. You see that their arms start to break off, or they get some uh, they get some other types of damage or strange types of growth, which you don't see in other systems. Um, and the other option is just to move the, ves the vessel themselves. So move the vessel in which the larvae are in. So it can either be a rotor uh, bowl or a table where you uh, gently shake them. And that's the method I will talk be talking about in more detail later in the presentation. So when we first started in Leeward, we started working on these chrysal tanks, which is like a jellyfish tank. It's a circular motion, and you can do it either with air or with water. We started with water, but we needed to put so much pressure on the system that the filters could not get rid of the water we would be pumping in, so it would overflow. So we either would overflow the system, or the larvae would still sink to the bottom. So that was, yeah, unfortunately, uh, not successful. We tried to create an airlift system in this system as well, uh, but there were still some dead spots and the larvae did not develop that well. This is from the paper I just talked about from Pilnik from 2001, where they have these very nice half chrysal design. So a chrysal is a round tank. This tank is round for half parts and they have an airlift system in the straight parts. And they pulse aerate. So they do uh, aerate in this part. Water goes up, and then you get this current over here. It's also being recirculated and treated so you get really clean water. And this seems to work quite well uh, with ups and downs. But this is for a large scale, very nice system which, which would work. Uh, another paper, and it's also where Jimmy uh, Eckert so the first published about it, called in his uh, pedal wheel. So this is a nice do-it-yourself project if you, uh, if you feel like you're up to it. But they actually use coat hangers to create panels within the bubbles. And this entire structure on top would just be moved like this with a small motor. And you would just get a gently paddling within the water. And they had successfully cultured a uh, diadema larvae in this as well. So this is low tech, you can build it yourself. Uh, and, and, and it is something that has been shown to work. Um, the third report from 2009 that I showed, they uh, use rotor bottles. So you just have bottles on a table with uh, these rotors on them. You move the water and this also seems to work. We tried it in the airport as well. We got some nice larvae from them. Uh, it also might be more uh, easy to scale up 
uh, to get larger models on uh, bigger uh, bigger systems, but I haven't tried that yet. And the last one that I'll talk about more is about the shaker table. So this is an orbital orbital shaker table, which is used a lot in uh, microbiology. So if you want to inoculate bacterial cultures, for instance, we had one of these tables in the lab I was working in in uh, Leeuwarden. And Elwin and one of my students, they said, why don't you try to put them in there instead of the Chrysler, put it. I was, <laughs> normally, I, normally, I only say that the student uh, told it to me, but also Elwin told it to me. So um, then we tried it with the shaker bottles, and that worked quite well from the start, actually. Uh, so well that we expanded this uh, quite a lot. I'll go into detail about the shaker bottle, what we use uh, more, but first some more essentials. And one of the essentials for uh, marble culture is the brood tub, which we talked about. The continuous water movement, you have different tastes, but uh, you need water movement, otherwise they sink to the bottom. Two other things which are extremely important are a source of clean water and a high quality feed, in this, uh, which in this case is uh, microalgae, which they also feed on in nature. Uh, you really need clean, clean water because the larvae of diadema are very sensitive to uh, also uh, metals which are diluted in the water. So you want your water to be as clean as possible. You can use natural seawater. Uh, of course, filter it before you use it. You don't know what's in there. Uh, and especially now, of course, with the disease roaming around again, you still have the chance of using infected water. Uh, if you have a culture running for 50 days and then a fisherman leaves some oil and you filter your water, but there's still some oil going through or something else, and your larvae culture dies, that's painful and expensive. So you don't want that to happen. So, what I would recommend is use artificial seawater. Especially if you're culturing on a smaller scale, you don't need that much salt water and fresh water to mix. So it's you have the most control of the source of water that you start with. Um, very specific, but if people want to know, we use tropic marin sea salts, uh, the reef mix variants. Uh, our colleagues in the United States, uh, Joshua Patterson and Aaron Pilnick, they also use this same sea salt and it works for the diadema larvae. So why try something else? For the fresh water that you need to mix with the uh, with the salts, um, in here we use reverse osmosis water. So you have tap water, you get it through a filter, get it as clean as possible, mix it with the salts, uh, keep it mixed for two days, then use it for the cleaning of the bottles and go to your larvae. Um, here on Seba, we don't have uh, osmosis device, so we use bottled drinking water. So we really treat them with the highest amount of uh, quality water. And it also seems to work. Uh, rainwater is also quite clean, so it could also work if you use rainwater, um, make sure your gutters are clean and maybe filter it still afterwards. But really take good care of the source of water that you're using because they're quite sensitive to small changes. Um, the last thing is microalgae. So the uh, larvae themselves throughout their uh, larval phase, they need to be fed with microalgae. It's also a natural source for wild larvae. There's over 50,000 species described, and there are estimates that there are about 800,000 different species of microalgae. Um, if you eat fish because of the good fatty acids, it all starts with microalgae. They are actually the ones that are capable of making those long chain fatty acids. Um, Many species have been used to culture diadema, either uh, just one species by itself or mixes of different species. But what we also found in the four papers that I just shown and what we know in general is that Rhodomonas, which is kind of in the name, but it's also a red microalgae, uh, is essential to get them from their uh, young larval phase to the sediment phase. So for our culture, we just use Rhodomonas. Uh, in particular, we use Rhodomonas uh, salina. In general, it's quite easy to culture them if you know what you're doing. So I don't want to say microalgal culture is uh, easy. But if you want to culture the diadema, you definitely need to know how to culture microalgae. It's the hardest operation. If your uh, culture is fresh, your larval culture is gone as well because you can't feed them. 
just a few pointers. Um, we also culture them on artificial seawater. Just like plants, microalgae are small unicellular plants. You need to feed them with fertilizers. So in this case, the most important ones is uh, nitrate and phosphate. And you have iron and trace elements. Um, if you want to culture them, look up the F2 mix. This is a standard uh, mix for microalgal culture. If you want to know more about this, uh, send me a question or email me if you want to know more how to set up one of those uh, cultures. It's a plant, so of course you need lights. Um, we just use a simple uh, aquarium lights. We once made a mistake when uh, VHL, the university, was replacing all their fluorescent tubes with LED tubes. That I said, oh yeah, you can change them in my setup. We're going to save on costs. But there was no energy in the output. I mean, we can still see light, but you still need high energy output lights because otherwise the algae don't grow or don't make the same mistake. Uh, and we put a lot of aeration into our bottles as well. This is one to feed them with CO2, which they need for growth. And on the other hand, if you don't aerate them on high, uh, or high frequency, they tend to sink to the bottom. So you need to keep them just like a larvae, but you can be quite aggressive with the algae if you can do that in, uh, in high amounts. Then before feeding, you need to know how many algae you have. So you can look at the bottle and see how dark it is, which works surprisingly well. But if you want to do it more scientifically and precise, you can count them on these uh, hematocyte meters where you get this grid. And if you count the amount of algae and you know the volume that goes in one of those counter chambers, you can actually calculate how many algae you have in your culture and how much you want to feed to your larvae. And I'll get to some numbers about microalgal feeding uh, later on. And also for the workshop for the people who are here, uh, Kai will also talk about the microalgae today. So if you have questions about culture, you can also answer them for the people who are here in the, in the group. So what you need is root stock, continuous water movement for your larvae, clean water, and high quality feed in the form of uh, microalgae, especially in our mountains. Um, how did we get to this culture? And where are we now? So we started with uh, culture in late 2019. We bought these nice systems with chrysal tanks. Uh, we set them up. We got broodstock. We had some initial problems with getting our broodstock to spawn, but that was solved after about half a year as well. If you get them in your system, they're stressed. They need to uh, adapt to the change. You need to get uh, give them the right food. They need to well, they need to feel well before they start spawning. And uh, early 2020, we went to the University of Florida. That was uh, Joshua Patterson and uh, Aaron Pilnick, which I already mentioned, which were very kind to teach us everything about the culture because they had been working on it for two years uh, by then already. They got a lot of information from Martin Skip Moe, which is really famous in the diadema culture. He has entire basement full with tanks just to try to culture diadema, so true hero. Um, and what they told us was what I'm telling you now. You need water quality, you need the right feed, you need water movement. But they also showed very practical stuff like how do you count your larvae, how do the larvae look like. Um, so we really got a very giant head start by visiting them. They, they gave us a lot of information within the week, so I would really, really like to thank them for uh, working together. And we still work very closely together. If we find something, we, we uh, let each other know almost directly. So I really appreciate the, uh, the cooperation. Um, so like I said, the crisis didn't work for us. So we started uh, with something different, which is just very, it's, in the end, it's very easy, but we started with shaker bottles. We have these one meter standard um, laboratory bottles, which we place on a shaker table, an orbital shaker table, which is just being shaken like this. There's about 500 larvae in this bottle. It shakes like this, it keeps them up the bottom, and you need to keep them on there for 35 to 90 days. You need, to, you need to shake them just enough that they're in suspension. So if you can look into the bottle and you can see that they're sinking, just increase the RPM a little bit. If you see that they're like truly shaking, lower it and make sure that you take, because they still get damaged. 
We feed and clean the bubbles twice a week. So twice a week, they're just like babies. It's terrible. You only need to feed them and clean them. So we, uh, we seize them. So depending on how big they are, we uh, throw them over a sieve. We turn the sieve around, use fresh, uh, newly made artificial seawater to put them in clean bubbles. And we do that twice a week. Um, if you're doing well, after about 30 to 40 days, you get your first competent larvae, and then you can think about sediments. Um, so this is a nice article that these snails are published on their sites. Um, in Leeuwarden, we were so successful that we had hundreds of juveniles. Many of them survived with thousands of, com thousands of competent larvae. Um, and we ended up either giving them to pet shops or, and we brought uh, a nice group to a, uh, to a zoo because we're in the Netherlands, it's cold. Where are you going to bring the diadema? It's really far too difficult to transfer them to the Caribbean. Nice update as well is that this is our first generation that we culture in Leeuwarden. And my colleague, Yurin, and her team, I think they're also watching, so hi. Uh, they were able to use our uh, generation, our F2 generation, our F1 generation to culture another batch of urchins. So it's a bit ancestral, ancestral that like brothers and sisters were used to create a new generation. But I'm I'm grandfather now, so I'm really, really happy with that. And I think that really cool moves. They spawned after eight months, mostly the males. The females needed a little bit more time to uh, to be able to spawn. After a year, also the females were able to spawn. Uh, and the first settlers were collected uh, last month. So it's really really cool and also new news. Um, when we are culturing the larvae, there's a couple of culture parameters which are quite important. On picture A here, you see how we measure the length and the width of the larvae. We use the size of an ellipse to calculate the body surface of the larvae. And then we score whether they are competent or not. So on picture B, you see next year external rudiments. It's still quite small. There is some tube feed, but it's not fully developed yet. So we wouldn't call it a competent larvae. But on page you see, you see the nice this laria on the 0.5, and it's really big white tissue where it's just rudiment. So the first formation of the blue earth. Um, what we don't use and what we don't measure, we do measure, but we don't use it is the arm length. Because the arm length of the larvae is mostly dependent on the system they're culturing. If there's very little current, they get really long arms. And if there's a lot of current or turbulence, they get very short arms. So you can measure it, but it doesn't really say that much. Now I've got a lot of graphs, of which the uh, one on the left and in the middle are uh, were cultures in the Netherlands. The one on the right was in Apollo Beach in Florida from Aaron and Josh, where we tested on the left, we tested the amount of feet that we gave, so the amount of cells of rhodomonas per milliliter, so it's between 30,000 and 90,000 microalgal cells per milliliter of culture. We also tested the larval density. Of course, you want to have a lot of larvae in your bottle because the more larvae can fit in your bottle, the more, you, more output you have. But you can put too many in the bottle as well. Then they don't develop well. Uh, and on the right, there was just a confirmation that the method itself can be reproduced in a different place with different circumstances. And you can still see that the more feed you give, the higher the supply is. I'm not going to describe them, I'm just going to summarize uh, what we see. So, in general, uh, the optimal larval density you can use in a bottle is about 0 0.5 to 0.1 larvae per milliliter, which means that in a bottle of 500 milliliters, you can hold about uh, 250. 100 to 250 larvae, which is not a lot, but on one of those shaky tables, we can hold about nine bottles. We tested different temperatures between 25 degrees and 28 degrees. We didn't see any difference. So if you stay within that range, that's fine. Um, and we now start feeding with lower density. So we start from day three to day 11 with 15,000 uh, microalgal cells per milliliter. And we slowly crank that up to 60,000. So the larger, the bigger they are, the more they feed, of course. You can 
try to optimize even further by mixing in different species of algae. Uh, but Rodimonas works perfectly, so we just use Rodimonas. How much time do I have left, Ali? Do you know? Uh, you're supposed to go. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's, that's, that's fine. <laughs> okay, so, uh, oh, salty. Uh, the next success was uh, here on Seva. So in June, we moved, the, uh, we moved to Seva. We got the entire setup over here because it was nice that we could call them Gearwater, but now we also were able to do that in, uh, on Seva. So another DCNA and Linux Bulletin. Um, we had a lot of trouble with uh, getting the right temperature in the lab at first. Uh, we once overfed our cultures. We fed them with 150,000 uh, cells of microalgae on accident. Don't do that, they don't like it. So we crashed the culture that was going really well of 50 days. My heart still sore from that moment. Um, but we had a very successful run as well in January where we tested different settlements cues on the larvae. So here we see a setup on the bottom left. We see all kind of petri dishes, which we, uh, we, we use one of those formal trees to put the petri dishes in and leave them for a different time. Ellen already talked about biofilm. So we let the biofilm develop of one week, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, and compare that to the sediment rate of the diadema. So what you can clearly see is on the graph, is if you don't have any cues in your petri dish, if you just have a clean petri dish with clean water, they don't settle, even if they're confident. If you have biofilm of one week, some settle, but it, the, the biofilm is not that developed yet, so maybe the chemical cues that are being released is not enough. And with two weeks, you see this high peak where more than 50% of all the larvae developed into a small urchin after four weeks. So that's really nice. And this experiment was done by John, by the way. I think she's also working, so this is John. Uh, with, which put a lot of energy in culturing all the larvae and getting these really nice results. And all the way on the right, we have uh, CCA, which we also test because we know CCA works. So the tiles that were just shown in the previous presentation with like the, the gray CCA growth, it's good for coral settlement, but it's also good for diadema settlements. So you really want to get that machine working again by getting a nice bare substrate with CCA. Let's get back to the bioballs of Elwin. You want to have that fresh layer of biofilm, and the later biofilm it still worked, but the uh, the urchins they they died sooner because they they see there seems to be some interaction as well. What do we need to do now? We need to upscale, increase early sediment survival, and develop a rearing techniques that uh, yeah you you want to have as strong urchins as possible. I'll go through a bit quicker so if there's more questions later especially for the audience here. Uh, you can ask them later. This is a very nice picture from, uh, from Aaron, uh, from Aaron Pilnick, where you can see how this would look like. So you have a wild population, you use them with rootstock, you culture them, uh, you get them to sell, you grow them out to perfect size and you put them back on the reef. And this is a nice system that eventually is something you would like on places where you want to restore diadema. Here on Sable, we get the, the marine lab, which is being built right now, which is almost finished. And Ayumi will show you today for people who are here. So that's nice. Uh, now we're working in a rusty container, which also works. But I mean, it's we can have more ideal circumstances as well. And something else is uh, we're trying to culture now in these 10 liter bottles, which are used for fermentation, for making wine with an airlift system. And this also still seems to work for, for larval culture. They don't develop as good, but they develop well, we can get settlers with it in higher amount with less efforts. So we really need to find that sweet spot where you can uh, culture thousands of larvae. And then the larval culture, not the bottleneck, but most likely your grow out system will be the bottleneck of, uh, of your culture. Ellen also touched this a little bit. The early juvenile survival was quite a sensitive phase of the urchins. So the juveniles that Elwin finds already went through selection process. So the weak ones or the ones that didn't really quite go through metamorphosis, you won't find them. Um, so we have an even higher mortality with the cultured ur urchins compared to the ones which are being collected on um, settler traps. But it's the same, provide them with enough food. So biofilm in the first few weeks 
techniques, uh, microalgae later, and make sure you remove your micro predators in the system where you culture them. Because if you have a small crab in there, you can ruin your entire culture. Um, after that, you have to rear them, so you need to rear urchins which are able to survive in the wild. There are some indications, there's a paper by Sharp et al. that says that the cultured urchins show different behavior and also different morphology, so less spines and weaker spines compared to their wild counterparts. So we need to think about ways to rear them in which they are strong enough to release. Uh, there have been quite some restocking experiments with diadema, but overall the retention is quite low, so not many of them survive. And you want to increase that survival by choosing the right location, but also by having a strong urge to put on those weeks. To sum up, uh, culture of diadema is uh, quite hard and requires a lot of patience. Um, but the shaker bottle method works quite well, and we have quite constant results with those and quite a constant output of competent larvae. You really need Rodomona, so you really need to culture microalgae, especially Rodomona, if you want to have a successful culture. We can do it near the reefs where they are needed very much, as we've proven here on Seba. Uh, when you settle them, they really do need that bare substrate, uh, early biofilm, CCA. So that goes for when you want to culture them a mess, but it also goes for if you want to have them settle in nature. So we can now answer these questions, uh, like why is the uh, recovery limited? We can also back that up with data, which we collected in the lab. And for larger scale implementation, you really need to further optimize, get cheaper, bigger, easier systems, so you have a high output of larvae and hopefully get them out on the reefs as soon as possible. So you have your uh, restoration methods. Uh, Ellen talked about translocation, which is possible on small scale. Sample collection can be done with low cost, but is, natural, is dependent on natural larval supply. So if you don't have larvae on your reefs, it's, it's not feasible. Assisted natural recovery seems to work really well, but needs optimization. And again, it's dependent on natural input of larvae. Um, and culture from gametes is also a possibility. But it requires a lot of efforts. It needs optimization, so you're not dependent on natural uh, populations. So that's, I think, the takeaway message of uh, if you want to restore diadema, these are the tastes and choices that you have. Um, I'd like to thank you guys for listening, and I'd like to thank all the people who have helped with the research. Uh, there's these are all the students who helped, but also. A lot more people, Elwin, of course, uh, for uh, initiating the project and uh, making sure that this is all possible. Um, are there any questions? Uh, there's some questions from over here, if you like. Yeah, sure. Uh, there's one from James. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. You may have said this, but wondering about the gabby retrieval process. What is the survival rate of the adult urchins exposed to the heat shock method? Yeah, good question. So the question is, um, what's the survivability of the adult urchins when we give them that heat shock method to get the gametes? And it's on the screen. Maybe you can see it. Um, and yeah, it's a good question, and the survivability is really high. We've never seen any stress or mortality after we spawn them. So uh, yeah, if you, if you have a limited population, this is a very friendly method to get them to spawn. What I do like to add is that um, they, they don't always spawn. So we have moments where a portion of the population doesn't spawn, and we have intervals, if it doesn't work, of about two to three weeks of which we give them uh, a resting period before we try again. So if, if they spawn and the spawn was unsuccessful, we don't directly spawn again to give them some time to recuperate as well. Nice. Um, okay, any other questions from here? No? Oh, wait, they're writing another one. And Aaron is there too, so that's, uh, that's nice. Hi, Aaron. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, that's Thanks about it for questions. <laughs> so, uh, housekeeping before we move on to lunch. I need to know from people 
How many here need to have a COVID test before you go back to your country? Island, whatever. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Zoom. Uh, we're going to stop the. <laughs> we're going to stop the presentation now. Thanks, everyone. Bye.